Thank you very much, Leland. Thank you, Tianlin, for organizing. And uh, I'm going to talk to you another high TRL, as uh, Roger would say, uh, but a, a little bit different kind of mission. A uh, temporal experiment for storms and tropical systems a demonstration, a CubeSat mission. So it's led by Colorado State University. I'm the PI. Uh, we're doing the validation and science led by uh, Professor Chris Kumaro and Professor Chandra, along with Dr. Westberg. And uh, JPL has provided the instrument for Tempest D. And uh, Todd Geyer has been the project manager uh, pre-launch, and Shannon Brown now post-launch. Uh, Sharmila Padmanabhan, who is my PhD student at Colorado State and has been at uh, JPL for about 11 or 12 years. She's uh, the instrument manager. Uh, Dr. Boon Lim uh, was uh, Chris Ruff's PhD student here at University of Michigan. Yeah. And Shannon as well. Thank you. <laughs> I always leave somebody out. Yeah, yeah. So star students from uh, Chris Ruff's group. And, uh, and uh, then we have, of course, uh, students uh, and postdocs right now at uh, Colorado State. I'll show you some of their work. And uh, the spacecraft was provided by Blue Canyon Technologies, a company in Boulder. This, so this is part of the new space industry that's uh, increasing these days. And they also provided uh, uh, the, the bus and mission operations for Qbert, led by Joel Johnson at Ohio State. And we'll show you Qbert because we were deployed uh, right with them. So in any case, uh, also Blue Canyon does mission operations and uh, ground communications was done by NASA Wallops. So here you see three images from passive microwave. And, uh, and the question is, you know, can you tell just by looking which one came from a CubeSat? Well, it turns out to be the, the center one is from a CubeSat. This is the team. I'll introduce them later. And these others are, uh, are basically operational instruments, AMSR2 and SSMIS. And so then we can look at not only uh, Hurricane Lorenzo here from this September 26th, but we can look at the whole globe. And, uh, and other than the, these uh, white spaces, which are determined by the swath width, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between these two. But I'll tell you, one of them is from uh, a CubeSat. Another one is from a large operational sensor. Well, it turns out that sensor B is uh, NOAA's advanced technology microwave sounder. Uh, manufactured by Northrop Grumman and integrated here at Ball Aerospace in Boulder. And here you see the size on the human scale. Uh, and so it's 75 uh, kilograms in mass, 100 watts in power consumption, and $4 signs on Yelp. As <laughs> <laughs> Tempest D is, uh, is much cheaper. I don't have a one-for-one -one comparison, but it is uh, f about five times smaller in mass and power consumption. At 3.8 kilograms and six and a half watts, and here it is on the table. That's a 4U. Uh, so 1U is a 10 centimeter cube, uh, classically with mass at 1.3 kilograms. Uh, it turns out you can get a higher mass density by 50 percent if you scale up from a 3U to 6U a CubeSat. But uh, this is Todd Geyer, uh, the uh, the project manager, as I mentioned. That's Heather Lim, Alan Tanner, Sharmila Padmanabhan, Rudy Bendig, and Boon Lim. So uh, this, is, this is for you, so about uh, 20 by 20 by 10 centimeters, and, uh, and again, you know, less than four kilograms. And so that's for you out of the six U that's in the spacecraft, and the solar panels uh, are deployed here. So uh, the context is, and this, really the scientific motivation, uh, is back to we originally proposed a constellation of five of these Tempest D CubeSats as uh, Tempest Constellation. It addresses the U.S. Uh, National Academy's Earth Science Decadal Survey that came out in 2017. They had a most important science question as what do, why do convective storms, heavy precipitation, and clouds occur exactly when and where they do? So we get information uh, for solving this question uh, to, by looking at temporally resolved observations. So uh, again, you know, Chris Ruff showed you uh, the the geo, geostationary satellite uh, visible and their infrared results, they can give you good, very good time resolution on the order of, with GOZAR, on the order of a few minutes. Uh, but they don't see into the cloud, as Chris described very well. They, they give you the morphology of the cloud. There are, there are algorithms that can tell you the wind speed, but they don't tell you the structure inside the storm. And so here we can see into the, the cloud, and we can see cloud and precipitation processes using a train of identical millimeter wave radiometers. So we originally proposed five with uh, 
about eight of them you, you, every thir three to four minutes, you can observe for up to 30 minutes. And that's enough for a vertical development of uh, convective clouds and uh, showing the surrounding water vapor environment. And so what we got was one technology demonstration mission. Uh, actually, we built two of them. We launched one of them as Earth Venture, NASA Earth Venture technology demonstration mission, uh, which was a 6U CubeSat, which we got ready for launch two and a half years after the funding started. So that's very accelerated. I mean, Cygnus was accelerated as well, but compared to the large missions like GPM that Darren McKaig will talk to you about, uh, this, this is very much faster, an order of magnitude faster than sometimes than the whole process of, of getting a billion dollars together for a large mission, a uh, science mission at NASA anyway. So this was able to be launched. Uh, launch was provided for free by the CubeSat Launch Initiative, which is for uh, universities, uh, nonprofits, and NASA centers in the US. Uh, and it was launched by Orbital ATK. That's since been bought by Northrop Grumman. Uh, and that was on a commercial resupply service to the International Space Station, such as SpaceX also does. And so along with the astronauts, uh, fresh fruit and ice cream. Uh, we, we were there uh, delivered on uh, May 21st uh, to the station. And then the, you know, when the astronauts got to it and could operate the robot arm, uh, we got deployed uh, on July 13th, about uh, two months later. So uh, here's, a, uh, here's just some uh, nice pictures of, of the eight satellite uh, proposed train and about the amount of overlap as the Earth moves underneath the uh, the the uh, satellites, which are in the same orbital plane. Here are some actual observations from Tempest D. And then these are, this is an animation of uh, a retrieval uh, at, at different depths from aircraft measurements, where we flew over in the Pacific Ocean. A pilot actually flew over uh, the storms multiple times every, every six minutes to show that we have information that on this time scale. So uh, a little bit more uh, for your interest about the, the spacecraft. The spacecraft is 6U, again, 30 by 20 by 10 centimeters. The, uh, that's the spacecraft bus. The uh, avionics is produced by Blue Canyon Technologies. It uses uh, three-axis uh, reaction wheels and three-axis magnetotorque rods to orient uh, the uh, satellite and uh, to know, know its orientation, know where it is. We have uh, a GPS antenna and, a, and uh, two star trackers and a sun sensor uh, as well, and all the flight computers inside there, the electric power system, and so on. We charge the battery with uh, uh, five solar panels. Five out of these six are populated for the solar rays, and so one is horizontal and the other is up at uh, 45 degrees. And here's uh, the 4U size instrument. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and we have uh, UHF for our primary ground communications. We can get some information through Global Star as well. Uh, the Global Star S band was right there, but we don't do operations through that. We just do, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we have commands that we have to get through and don't have any other way. So, the, uh, a little more about the Tempest D instrument. So, microwave sounders uh, tend to be cross track scanning. So they're moving, so if this is the direction of satellite motion, they're scanning like this. And so uh, we're observing the Earth scene centered at nadir, uh, up to plus minus 60 degrees uh, in, in angle on the Earth scene. And every revolution of that scanning happens in two, every two seconds. So every two seconds, we are also able to see, we're able to look out to the side and see the cosmic microwave background, which is very homogeneous at these frequencies, isotropic, and it's 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, from the Big Bang. And then the uh, calibration target we view is a Zax millimeter wave calibration target that's uh, uh, been flown in space before uh, of this type. So the, um, our radiometers are based on uh, some low noise amplifiers that, uh, uh, that show the record lowest noise temperature of 300 to 350 Kelvin in this uh, frequency range from 140 to 190 gigahertz. And so they were produced at north of Grumman uh, in California and designed in collaboration with JPL. This is a 35 nanometer indium phosphide hemp process, and it's, it's tough to find. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's the technology. And the fact that it's, it's such low noise, uh, we were able to have direct detection of receivers. And so uh, this, is the, this is the first time it's been deployed for Earth science at these frequencies. 
uh, the the uh, low noise amplifiers, and so they're they're uh, you know we raised the TRL level to nine uh, of this whole system. So let me go through the instrument a little bit. This is an offset paraboloid reflector that you see here, and the axis of rotation is vertical, and so that uh, focuses the uh, the rays from the, uh, you know, the, the earth scene radiation onto the feed horn. Uh, the feed horn has two waveguide outputs, one at G-band here for 164 to 181 gigahertz, and the other one over here on the right at W-band. And the, uh, the low noise amplifiers, of course, are in the radiometer front end, but they're also in the power divider to compensate for the insertion loss added by the power divider. And then we have a filter bank of four waveguide iris space filters and uh, four detectors that are tuned for the, the, you know, for matching for 164 to 181 gigahertz. And then on the right is the W band receiver at 87 gigahertz, basically the same components without the power divider, uh, but working at W band. So all five of these channels then are, are fed into the uh, command and data handling unit here, and the signals are conditioned and sampled, packetized, and sent to the ground. Uh, and of course, we have the power regulation there too. So the instrument was, uh, was tested at JPL for space-like conditions and thermal vacuum, as well as vibration tested. Uh, and so, you know, it passed all that with flying colors and then was uh, delivered to Blue Canyon Technologies. Blue Canyon Technologies integrated it in the spacecraft bus, and this is a photo in thermal vacuum. Uh, and this is a instrumented uh, load here uh, viewing out this direction. So you can see that, that a reflector antenna is here. The instrument is uh, the 4U out of 6U right here. So in thermal vacuum, we swept it over the temperatures that we would be observing on orbit and, and more, and we found that the noise characteristics, the noise behavior is very flat with frequency, but we uh, you know, recorded the, the, any variations. And it turns out that, the, so these five frequencies, this is the any delta T, the uh, smallest signal that you can reliably measure. And the units are Kelvin. So it's a power scale to, uh, to Kelvin like we do in, in radiometry. And the uh, noise, te the, sorry, the radiometric resolution is 0.2 to 0.7 Kelvin uh, over these five channels. And, and it gets noisier as you get closer to the 183 gigahertz water vapor absorption line. But they, these are very low, and they they're compare very well with on-orbit values. I point out that it was measured, we measure with 5 millisecond integration time. So that becomes important when you compare with some of the on-orbit sensors, like MHS has 18 millisecond integration time. We'll come back to that. Why? Because the, the radiometric resolution is also a function of the bandwidth. It's, inversely proportional to the square root of the bandwidth. So, uh, sorry, of the integration time too, both. So here's the, here's the launch on May 21st, about a year and a half ago. Uh, this was about uh, 1.30 in the morning. Uh, we showed up there at, at Wallops, and uh, the launch went off very well. So then, uh, two months later, I mentioned, is the deployment. And so here you see Tempest-D uh, shortly after deployment and Qbert. They're both 6U satellites. You notice there's a difference here. Uh, and this will, this video will show you a little of the difference. So watch, watch here, uh, going to the upper left, and there going to the lower right. It happens very quickly. There you go. So you see what happened. Uh, that, that's actually Tempest D was the one waving its its wings, and uh, Qbert was right right behind it. So they were right together. So we we weren't intended to. Uh, deploy the wings right there, but everything snapped into place, and it worked. <laughs> so it was a test of what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> and so um, then uh, after got some ground communications, hitches worked out because they were just starting to support uh, UHF communications, and, uh, and uh, we were just starting uh, mission operations. Uh, so we got our first data, first light on September 11th of last year. And, uh, and if you look over in the Atlantic sector here around the, the areas that uh, Chris Ruff talked about uh, around, uh, you know, 20 to 30 uh, north, and then you find that we got, we measured, captured three hurricanes in that first data set, those first few orbits. And so we were very fortunate uh, to get that. So these are the visible, the black and white images are the geostationary visible images to show you about those storms, and the, the color images are 164 gigahertz. 
uh, some of the pixelization is just from the, the display here. Uh, and so here you see uh, Hurricane Florence on the left and Hurricane Helene on the right. This is measured at 164 gigahertz. So you see that there's a lot of difference. If you compare the top to the bottom panel, just very simply, you see there's a lot of difference. We're, we're measuring the strengths of the rain bands here, uh, where, where it has uh, higher precipitation and, and so on. And so we're right in there looking into the storm, where the precipitation forms, where the action happens, where the microphysical processes are. And uh, so you can look not only at a single snapshot of a hurricane, but it turns out when we got to Hurricane Dorian, uh, which, which Chris also showed, Chris Ruff from uh, Cygnus, we measured it every day for a 10-day track. And so, of course, this can be done with other satellites, but this is the first time it's been done with a CubeSat. And, and of course, much lower cost than other missions. So here we have uh, a 10-day track for Hurricane Dorian. And, uh, and then uh, it turned out we deployed on the same day, uh, Tempesty and Cubert deployed on the same day as a rain radar from JPL, and it's called RainCube. So they had a dramatic kind of uh, antenna deployment of about a half meter uh, in diameter, and they're, they're measuring with a KA band radar, uh, measuring uh, reflectivity from storms. And so we had some, uh, you know, they have a very different drag profile from us. They don't completely track our, our orbit, but we have some coincident measurements. And we were able to measure uh, 17 days after deployment on September 28th, we were able to measure Typhoon Trammy over the Pacific. And, uh, and Cygnus also provided us, thank you, Chris, provided us with the wind fields uh, there. That's these contours. And the vertical plane measurements here that you can see are from the KA band radar, uh, the, the rain cube, and the horizontal plane measurements uh, the pancake uh, at the bottom is from uh, Tempest D. And we found that the, the uh, asymmetry in the, uh, you know, on either side of the uh, storm center was consistent between the radar and radiometry. And so we're looking for other uh, examples, too. There, there are a few that we've measured, but that was the, that was the big one that, uh, that we had for the coincidence between the heterogeneous. So, so it shows the potential. Since these are so cheap, they can be deployed so rapidly, then you have potential for heterogeneous type of constellations, not only homogeneous uh, types of sensors. So we spent, you know, we spent a lot of effort on looking at individual storms, looking at hurricanes, tropical cyclones, uh, typhoons, but we get global data too. And so here's, here's a global data from recent, at the end of October, uh, about a month ago. And then uh, I thought I'd show the globe for two weeks later. Uh, so this is 87 gigahertz. This, that's the uh, channel that sees the most from the surface. You clearly see the land water boundaries, and, and you see some, some you know, different features as well. But if you look here, that's October 26th, and that's November 11th. So again, October 26th, and look at North America, and November 11th. Yeah, so you see this change of seasons a lot with the, the, the cooling off of the surface here and, and some snow cover and so on, you even see in the, in the Himalayas. So, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, we're still getting global data down after 14 months. That's uh, 14 months after the, the first light. Uh, and, and here are the other four channels. That's from October 26th. So as you go from 164, 174, 178, 181, these are, you know, these are commonly used in, in uh, satellites like GPM you'll hear about uh, soon. And, uh, and so as you go closer and closer to 183 gigahertz uh, water vapor absorption line, you see higher and higher into the atmosphere. But here still at 181, you see the intertropical convergence zone that uh, Chris Ruff talked to you about, right, straight through there. And, uh, and so you, you've got a lot of useful data. And this is October 26th. And there again is two weeks later on uh, November 11th. You still see the, the, the cold regions on land here uh, that, are, that are developing. They're even, they're even nicer. So you see as the frequency gets further away from 183, you see the ground uh, more and more depending on the amount of water vapor and other things. So, um, okay, so here's a movie uh, back, going back to uh, uh, six months ago or five months ago in, uh, in May. Here's a whole week of... Uh, of Tempest data. And then you, you can look at a lot of interesting things like the gravity wave structures moving through uh, here at the, at the high latitudes. 
And then uh, some people ask about this uh, white thing that shows up every once in a while. Well, that's when right there. That's when we're pointing at our ground station at Wallops, because the ground station is pretty, pretty narrow. But that's not an inherent feature of CubeSats. I mean, it, it happened because we're using UHF communications. And, um, uh, but you know, when, when we use S-band, we can have a global kind of network. And right now, we're limited to only one ground station. We're still working on a couple of other possibilities for uh, a second ground station to get more of the data down to the ground. But this kind of ground communications is a, a solved problem, and it can be done on CubeSats. They are doing, Blue Canyon is deploying S-band radios right now. Um, and, and so that's uh, greatly upgraded. So uh, a little more about the instrument. We have uh, a very stable, extremely stable over the mission to date. These are the five uh, N-E-delta T's or radiometric resolution for the five channels uh, from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency. And this is over 13 months here uh, of the mission. So it's been extremely stable and, and we're very happy about that. Then another thing is I mentioned about the integration time and the bandwidth. When we compare it to the operational instrument on the uh, uh, NPOSE preparatory project uh, satellite, uh, the ATMS made by Northrop Grumman, here are their numbers for uh, their radiometric resolution. Then if we scale ours using scaling the integration time, so it's about a, a square root of three and a half, uh, one over square root of three and a half that we multiply it by for the integration time and then we rescale the bandwidths as well. We see that our numbers are about half on four out of five of the channels, our numbers are about half of what ATMS is. So we're doing, uh, showing improved receiver performance over the current generation of operational sensors. So then, there's a lot in this view graph, uh, but what we do, what we need to do then is ask how well are we doing compared to the gold standards on orbit, compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars missions, uh, how well are we doing? Well, you know, one of them that, that uh, Darren's done a lot of work on is GPM. Uh, and, uh, and so the GPM GMI means the Global Microwave Imager, which is the radiometer on GPM. It also has dual uh, channel radars, but I don't want to steal this thunder. OK, so GMI, then MHS is a microwave humidity sounder. So that has channels at quite similar frequencies to ours. Uh, and one of them is a NOAA satellite, and two others are UMETSAT by the, launched by the European Union, basically their equivalent of NOAA. And so we compared each of them to Tempest D. Well, and we used them as the, you know, a, a set of satellites that are gold standards. Well, we used what's called the double difference technique. And I'll just describe briefly that it's, it's used to uh, compensate for the fact that different satellites measure the same part of the atmosphere from different angles at different polarizations with different center frequencies and different bandwidths. Okay, so all of those things need to be compensated. How do you do that? Well, you solve a radiative transfer integral. You take what you know about the atmosphere. And so if, if I'm right here and looking up to satellite A, I solve that radiative transfer integral and predict what I would get measure at satellite A. And I take the difference between what's actually measured and what we predict, okay? And then for satellite B, we want to compare it to, I solve the radio transfer integral to that satellite and take that difference. So each of those is a single difference. If you take the difference between both of those numbers, that's the double difference. So the double difference is a, a, what GPM uses called the cross calibration team and led by Dr. Westberg at Colorado State University. Uh, and, and he did this work uh, on validation. And so what he found was that uh, we were within uh, within 0.7 Kelvin, if you look down here in the red box, for four out of five channels. And the problematic one is within under 1.3 Kelvin. So that problematic one is at 164 gigahertz, and that's known to have higher uncertainties due to some model issues with the knowledge of the emissivity of the ocean surface. And so there's, they know that more work needs to be done on that. That is true for operational sensors too. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're within less than a Kelvin on four out of five channels, less than a 0.7 Kelvin, and our standard deviation or our noise on the, that comparison, our stability over time is better, 0.5 Kelvin or better on four out of five channels, 0.7 on the, on, the fourth, on the fifth one. So in any case, this conservative calibration team says uh, Tempest D is a very well calibrated and stable radiometer with very low noise rivaling that of much larger operational instruments. And we compared here, this shows you all, each of the five channels 
over time, and sorry, it's unreadable. There, there are 21 days here over three and a half months. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, showing you the average temperature, too, on the right scale with the dotted lines so that uh, we, we don't show a bias with temperature. So mentioning temperature, uh, one thing people ask is, uh, as you go in and out of eclipse, because, of course, you're a low-Earth orbiting satellite, you go in and out of the Earth's eclipse many times, almost every orbit. So then uh, the question is, your, your instrument temperature is going to be changing. Well, does your calibration, the, you know, the, the quality of your measurements vary with that temperature. And here is what we studied. So here's the instrument temperature over uh, about 25 uh, degrees Celsius change. And, and the number of measurements is shown in the dotted lines. Each of the dotted lines are the same for all the five channels. So the number of measurements is much more over this eight degree. Each point is two degrees. So eight degrees Celsius kind of interval. And so we don't show any uh, discernible trend over, over temperature, particularly not in the, in the, where we have most of the measurements. So this shows no evidence of calibration errors associated with changes in instrument temperature, and this is over a full year of on-orbit operations. So uh, in the remaining time, sorry, uh, in, the, <laughs> in advance, uh, in, in the remaining time, I'll, I'll just talk to you about some of the nice things about being the only sensor on the satellite and the fact that you have the freedom to do some more uh, calibration. And so here, what we did was uh, uh, do, do a somersault, a 360-degree uh, pitch maneuver. And why, why do we do that? Well, we wanted to measure, wanted to see how over the swath where we usually view the Earth, we wanted to view the, uh, the cold sky, which is the cosmic background radiation. And we, we did that to be able to tell how much bias do we have as a function of of scan angle. And so we have less than a half a Kelvin before calibration, before correction of the antenna pattern, and about an order of magnitude lower than that afterward. So, uh, so then we did some science retrievals. This was Rick Schulte, a PhD student of uh, uh, Professor Chris Kumro at uh, CSU. And so he retrieved uh, water vapor on the left, uh, liquid cloud uh, contents on the middle, and ice cloud content on the right. And so what this is, uh, is the tempest is in the swath between these two red curves. And outside of the two red curves is a standard product from MHS, which is an operational sensor, and, uh, and using the NOAA algorithm, the MIRS algorithm. And so we see that, uh, you know, in, in, in the paper that's uh, in review right now, he, he shows them, you know, both uh, in front and behind. And so you see that for the uh, water vapor field, they're, they're, uh, the algorithms agree on the, on the features. You can't see any discontinuities uh, inside and outside, nothing major. And then here, uh, the cloud liquid, it shows the correct locations of liquid clouds. And then the ice, it shows correct uh, locations of, of the ice as well. So we have good uh, qualitative comparisons here. Uh, and then more quantitative comparisons are being shown in this paper. Then finally, we have, uh, you know, normally, these microwave sounders, I said, scan across track to get enough coverage uh, so they can have a uh, repeat of, you know, a couple of days, uh, one to two days. And so then uh, we thought, well, why don't we turn it sideways? So this is the, the first one that we know of that's been done. We, we can turn it about 90 degrees. And then what do we get? Well, we get, we're looking at the same, ap almost the same atmosphere at a variety of incidence angles. Why would you want to do that? Well, because... As the storms move through, you know, as, as the constellation comes up, those storms are going to be moving with the rotation of the Earth. And it's worst at, at the equator. And so, the, the, uh, so you want to be able to know that your geophysical retrieval works at a variety of incidence angles. And so that's what we did. And here are the Tempest D ground tracks on top of the MIRS product uh, that I just showed you, the MIRS algorithm from NOAA. Uh, and the... And then the Tempest retrieved uh, water vapor on the left and liquid water on the right. Show, what they show is consistency across, this is Earth incidence angle. They show quite a good consistency over, you know, plus minus 30 degrees uh, starting here over each column. And that's what and it, you see here. So basically the variability that we see is in uh, liquid clouds is small compared to the, the, the spatial variability, especially for 
for liquid clouds. So um, the data are available, are publicly, that's my 30 minutes, and um, <laughs> stop. So uh, they're publicly available on the server from Colorado State, tempest.colostate.edu. I just click data and you can uh, create an account and uh, download the data, take a look at them yourself, and uh, and we have documentation and, and processing algorithms there. That's the level one data they're being downloaded uh, from all over the world uh, here from a while, for a while. And so I'd like to thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Great talk. So you mentioned this is, you know, it's a few sets in early stage. What's the expected lifetime of the, of the mission, and then what's next from this? Because it looks like you get some really interesting data. Good questions. Um, we don't know the exact lifetime. There, there's one called Raven that has been on orbit for, I think, three years. Does that sound right? Uh, almost uh, about three years. And that's, that's a different bus, but it's operated by the same uh, Blue Canyon technologies. And so right now, it's, it's been on orbit for, um, you know, going on a year and a half. It's been operating for 14 months since we started the communication. So we want to keep it going as long as we can and get some valuable data for science. Is anything degraded? No. Um, no. Power, power systems, just the same as... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The one thing is we had to go to the backup memory card, but that happened, you know, with another brand of memory card on on Raven. But we had full; it was uh, cold uh, spare, so we switched over to that. And you know, so um, uh, what's next is we'd like to deploy a constellation. So and just since this is a TRL nine sensor and shown it works really well. Oh, and also. What I didn't add a slide on is that we have the spare that we have just in nitrogen storage at JPL right now. Uh, we've got an agreement to transfer it to the Air Force uh, because they are launching an instrument that uh, Shannon Brown, uh, you know, PhD from here, uh, designed in, uh, at, at JPL for the Air Force. And that's a lower frequency sensor called COVER, uh, the compact ocean wind vector uh, radiometer. And both of them will go on the International Space Station in uh, less than you know, about a year and a half or less than two years. Fantastic. Yeah. So then we'll get real-time data to the ground within about five minutes. And there's a lot of things that can be done with that. If it, if it works well, then there's a lot of uh, weather forecasting and data assimilation uh, interest in that. I was just wondering if the differences in the diurnal consistency of the scene uh, has any impact on the retrieval study, or is that just capturing your double difference? Um, OK, I understand the orbits are different. Yeah, yeah we're at about 51 degrees. Uh, I don't understand the diurnal well, I mean, issue. The, the, you know, ATMS and, and uh, the MEDOP, sort of MHS, sort of are able to capture the same scene at the sort of relative. Sort of same time of day. Um, I was, you know, okay, you're talking about mission design. Mission design, so that helps sort of, sort of baseline the consistency of the retrievals and also the data assimilation for um, you know, NWP. Well, I don't think, okay, I don't think that it's the consistency of retrievals. Is, I mean, we could be just as consistent. It's just that we have a different, uh, you know, a different mission from them. So just like GPM, GPM is also in a non-synchronous orbit. And so you get, you get some value because you get some diurnal variation as well. So there's, some, there's another instrument we worked on uh, to measure cloud ice that's related to the ice cloud imager that the Europeans are going to eventually launch here in a couple of years. Uh, and, uh, and so you know, we're looking at the advantages of having uh, non-synchronous information there, unlike the A-train. NASA's A train that provides information on, on clouds and ice, but well, it's not the same, not the same kind of instrument. But that this one's a submillimeter wave instrument. So, uh, so we uh, we're happy with what we've been able to get. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>